In this episode of the Smart Nutrition Made Simple show, I catch up with health and nutrition expert Ryan Kennedy for a candid conversation on a myriad of health-related topics, including the importance of optimizing our digestion. Uh, We talk about various ways to engage in physical activity throughout the day despite a busy schedule. And we also talk about the power in stacking your habits as you learn and as you grow and much, much more. Ryan is a functional medicine practitioner. He's a traditional naturopath and a board certified clinical nutritionist who takes a holistic approach to help his patients improve their health by utilizing results-based natural therapies. And unlike addressing symptoms like conventional medicine, Ryan uses a multidimensional approach to address the root cause and enhance your body's ability to heal. This was a fun conversation for me, for Ryan and to just catch up, talk shop, so hopefully you guys can glean some insight from this as well. As always, if you like the episode, share it with someone you love, subscribe, and leave us a five-star rating and review. Enjoy. Welcome to the show where we help you make smart nutrition simple. If you want proven nutrition strategies to help you build a better body and create the energy to show up for your family without overly restrictive and unrealistic dieting, then you're in the right place. Make sure to subscribe and enjoy this episode. Ryan, what's up, buddy? Ben, all good things, man. Happy to be here chatting it up with you and excited to share some value on all things health optimization. Same, dude. Super happy to connect. Been following your work for a little bit and figured it would be a great opportunity for us to just get on the horn together. We both have podcasts both in been, been in the space in different capacities for a while and you know just chop it up and and see kind of what things we're working on individually how we're impacting people in our own respective ways and hopefully share some value with each of our respective listeners that's what it's all about awesome dude so you said you were just on a little little fishing trip yeah, a little boating trip out to Catalina Island off the coast here of California, something I do a couple of times a year. One of my best buds has a nice boat that we take out and it's just a great time, man. Soaking up ample, sensible sun exposure, getting all up in the salt water, hunting for some food. It's just a blast, dude. But and, it also- you like, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's just really aligned with my philosophies in terms of just- to the you know rewilding of humans and just getting out in that natural environment with the negative ions and the proper lighting and you know going to bed at sundown waking up at sunrise no TVs no phones no cell phone service no EMFs you know all the things that just enable humans to thrive you know what what we're really it's conducive to our biology and how we function so after a trip like that you just feel totally just recharged man uh, I imagine you do, but as a father of three, um, <laughs> you know, living in urban Phoenix, that's something yeah. that I don't, unfortunately, don't get to experience very often. However, it's definitely something that is much needed. I, you know, I grew up in northern, well, I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, but I spent every summer in northern Minnesota and, and southern Canada, like there's this vast expanse of lakes uh, called the Boundary Waters. It's sort of a national park it's called the Boundary Waters and the Quetico, which is the southern, which is the Canadian uh, aspect of the Boundary Waters. And so we would all summer, we would canoe, you know, kind of from lake to lake and kind of you portage. So there's little trails that connect all of these lakes. We pack all of our own food and went on a number of different camping trips. But just that those opportunities are some of the the best like experiences that I've had in my life when I slept the best and yep. albeit I was a teen, but still something that I like yearned to get back to of just sleeping out on the rocks, seeing the Northern lights, packing all of our own food, fishing, yeah. like just the ultimate in like calmness, stress management. So I can certainly appreciate that rewilding aspect, which I imagine it's like for so many of us, that's, it's like the ultimate aspect of health improvement, right? We focus so much on our, on our, our, our food choices and our hydration levels and like our, our, our quote unquote stress management techniques. And yet the reality is simply separating ourselves from all of those modern day technologies in and of itself probably is the most beneficial thing that we can do for our health. 
Totally. And, and people could fit it in. It doesn't have to be this thought out week long trip where you take time off work. You could get micro doses of this throughout your day, just on your lunch break, walking down to the park, kicking your shoes off, soaking up some sun, getting your feet on the earth for 20 minutes. And, mm-hmm. you know, doing that on a regular basis throughout the course of the year is going to be far more impactful than trying to save it all for this perfect time and this perfect set and this perfect setting, which oftentimes becomes, you know, kind of a a bit of a pipe dream for a lot of folks because it does require a lot of planning. Like you said, you got a family to take care of, you got a business to run, you got a lot of responsibilities. And I think a lot of us can relate to that. But what we need to understand is it's not all or nothing mindset. It's like you don't have to go off grid for a week to reap these benefits. You could just lay out in your backyard for 20 minutes and, you know, talk, have, have a phone call, answer some emails, yeah. do your normal work. But now you're in an environment instead of indoors under these artificial junk lights, you know, surrounded by, you know, all these uh, different electromagnetic fields. Now you're just kind of separating yourself from that in a micro way, day to day, man, that is just transformative for people. Yeah. And I can appreciate that for sure. That's funny. It's, it's kind of a running joke with some of the clients uh, that I have in that, you know, I work with a lot of like corporate guys and executive types. And, and so they actually do make get a habit of going out on their lunch breaks, doing their phone calls outside. And I'm like, all right, dude, so you've improved your habits. Like you're moving more, you're getting your steps in. I'm like, just take your shirt off as you're walking around the building, get some of that, you know, vitamin D soaked in. Yep. And they're like, yeah, that's not going to happen at all. But, <laughs> you know, it's it's spot on though. It's yeah. spot on in terms of getting the sunlight on our skin. And, and some of those daily behaviors, um, truly are such a crucial aspect of improving our health. And I think that as I alluded to previously, like we can really get like myopic on some of the quote unquote biohacks that you have to be doing and like these expansive morning routines and all of the supplements that you need to be consuming when in reality, it's like, no, I mean, just moving enough, getting sunlight on your skin, actually getting enough hours of quality sleep. It's not what people want to hear, but unfortunately, it, it really is the nature of the beast. Yeah, it's all about coming back to the essentials, man. And, and what I always tell people is the proper execution of the fundamentals is so rare. Everyone's looking for that magic pill, that biohacking device or gadget that's going to change everything. And it's like all these devices are just trying to mimic the benefits we get from nature. And there's a time and place for that. Like you said, you grew up you know, near Minnesota or you know, if you're on the East Coast, it's like, yeah, if you're under four feet of snow, you're probably not gonna be getting your sensible sun exposure. So yeah, having like a red light panel or some you know, kind of biohacking gadgets to help mitigate some of that is absolutely better living through science as I like to call it. Mm-hmm. But when you have the ability to just reap those benefits from mother nature, it not only saves you money, but it's far superior when you look at the impact it's having, because uh, all these devices, as cool as some of them may be, they don't come close to the real thing. And that's what I tell everyone. Like, you don't need to go spend thousands of dollars on all these different gadgets if you just get outside, immerse yourself in some fresh air, some sunlight, you know, get, get grounded, you know, and, and all those things just start to compound and have this really powerful impact over time and this cumulative effect. So it's really transformative for a lot of people I work with of just saying, Hey, you know, just take your phone calls outside and get some movement in instead of sitting on your butt indoors. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's that simple. Have you found that these behaviors, I mean, obviously you got to start small with a lot of these things, especially for the busy parent like myself. Right. And, and so you start small. Have you found that these behaviors basically compound over time in terms of how people start to feel when they plug them in? 100%, man. And I'm all about habit stacking. You know, there's a lot of things you could stack together of things you're already doing. You know, you're not carving out new time in the day. You already have this time allotted for phone calls or this time allotted for, you know, whatever work you have on your plate or taking your kids here or there, playing with your, you know, whatever it is. And so if you just start to add in different things to those current habits, you know, now you're expanding the benefits. You're not taking up any more time. You're actually buying back time because your energy, your focus, your productivity is just way better. So in a lot of respects, you're gaining time. And when you start to break it down like that, I, I always have people start slow to really help with compliance. But then as they get in their groove, they start to really develop these routines then you can start adding layers to it. And before you know it, it's like, yeah, you're doing 15 things in your morning routine, but you know what? It only takes 10 minutes, you know? So once you start to really bring that efficiency component to it, complete game changer. Yeah. I think once you start to see the benefit of it, like I have a lot of guys and and women, to be fair, I have a lot of, of clients that 
have found because of all the things that we're discussing. So they found um, how their productivity increases when they're when they're standing up, when they're moving, when they're yep. on the on a call, and they can actually think more clearly, and their brain functions a little bit better being away from the screen. Uh, they're coming up with better ideas, and so they'll run more business meetings from their phone while they're walking around, and so on and so forth. And I I certainly feel the same myself, but I I know we know that. Uh, there's so much benefit to dissociating ourselves from the screen and by virtue of movement, actually helping our brain function better, think more clearly and so on and so forth. And that's huge, man. Just the impact that could have in boosting BDNF, brain derived neurotrophic mm-hmm. factor, and just all the different things from blood sugar control to all sorts of metabolic health parameters to increase blood flow to the brain. You know, one of the things I really teach a lot of uh, patients I work with is what I call trigger sessions, just mixing in these brief bursts of movement. You know, you don't have to work, work out in this confined period of time at the gym, you know, for 45 minutes and then just sit on your butt all day and kind of negate a lot of those benefits. It's so much better to do a shorter workout and then just mix in every hour, you know, in between meetings, set an alarm, set a reminder, whatever it takes to just pop off your butt, do a quick set of body weight squats, do a quick set of lunges, quick set of pushups. You know, we're talking 60 seconds, you're not going to break a sweat. You're not going to be, you know, huffing and puffing, but that little burst of movement, that little interrupt into your sedentary time is so freaking helpful for so many people, especially if they're looking to lose weight and improve their metabolic health. I mean, that has been a, a complete, complete game changer for a lot of people I work with. Cause you know, it's just, it, it's easy. It's not that hard mm-hmm. to, to just do 15 body weight squats and then just go right back to what you were doing, you know, right back to your next meeting. You know, that's something, have you found the same thing with your clients in terms of breaking movement up sprinkled in throughout the day versus a structured workout all at one go? Yeah, to a degree. And and we do a different version of that. And I, and I have found value in that. It's just, I've, I've encountered a little bit more resistance to the short bursts frequently throughout the day. And, and that's just, you know, it is what it is. And to be fair, I'm not sure I put too much emphasis on it. But what I've started to establish with a lot of clients is instead of this idea of we need to work out and like have this structured strength training program, like three days a week for 45 to 60 minutes or four days a week for 45 to 60 minutes, I started to realize that the value really lay in the consistency of the daily behavior. So if it's like you get up at 5 a.m. and you drink your water and and, you know, you, you head over to the gym or you have a gym at home over the past you know, 18 months, a lot of clients have built out their own respective home gyms. But what I found is that the uh, compliance increased when I started giving people something to do every single day, even if it wasn't quote unquote structured strength training, sure. but it was like, you know, some uh, deep breathing, some kind of guided stretching coupled with breath work. It was just some low intensity uh, cardiovascular aerobic movement, you know, riding their Peloton at a low intensity for a heart rate or um, doing some sort of low intensity body weight circuit coupled with their respective days of strength training. And that actually has significantly improved, improved compliance for a lot of clients. It's helped improved results, but it's also helped them just be more consistent, yep. you know, day in and day out, especially if you think about kind of typical person and maybe they'll work out, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then Saturday, Sunday are total bust by virtue of people's typical weekend behaviors. But if they know that they have something structured, especially on the weekend as well, right, people are going to be a lot more likely and they know that they're being held accountable to it. They know they have set structure. They're going to be a lot more likely to be consistent with it, which you and I both know that maintaining our our normal sleep patterns, especially through the weekend in and of itself is so valuable as opposed to staying up late on Friday night and Saturday night, then sleeping in and then going back to your early morning routine. So simply having that daily structure of movement, different capacity than yours, but very similar just in terms of some structure, obviously the benefits of exercise have really worked quite well. 
That's the name of the game, man. Just finding something that builds that consistency in a sustainable fashion. Because mm-hmm. people get so caught up in all the minutia, you know, the logistics of how many sets, what type of angles, what type of resistance training are you doing? Are you doing this type of periodization? You know, all the all the more yeah. technical aspects, which I think there's a time and place for, especially mm-hmm. for elite athletes and, and people in different you know demographics. But for most folks, it's just about moving your body on a daily basis, you know, whatever that looks like. Whatever that looks like is right. So let me ask, you seem like a pretty young dude. How old are you? 27. Okay. So you're a young dude. You're obviously Mm -hmm. a super smart dude. How did you get into all of this at such a young age? Bit of a tragedy. My health journey really began when I was 14. My mom was diagnosed with cancer. And at the time, didn't know really the scope of what that meant. I just remember her going through the conventional treatment model. Mm -hmm. You know, growing up, we were, you know, standard family, didn't practice any type of, you know, holistic remedies or any type of naturopathic medicine. We were just more so go to the doctor, take whatever prescriptions they gave you, yeah, kind of sure. trust trust in the medical system. Did you and grow up in San Diego? Grew up in Southern California, up San Diego. And so I saw over the course of those two years, her go through these gnarly, you know, chemotherapy, radiation, surgery. You know, I remember her oncologist telling her what you eat doesn't matter. No supplements, yeah. vitamins, herbs are going to help you. This is your only option. Just really poo-pooing on anything be, you know, that's those kind of against the modern medical system. And unfortunately, in large part, due to the misinformation she received, she passed away two years later, in 2010, when I was 16. And that really spun me off in in trying to figure out this stuff, you know, because I obviously wanted to live a long, healthy life. She died at the age of 54. And as, as tragic as it was, it was really a pain to purpose story where I saw the pain it caused to my family and to me and just figured, you know, this is what I want to help others with. I want to help people that are in my mom's situation understand there are other modalities, there are other treatment options and other things that can even be just as an adjunct to the conventional, you know, kind of route when it comes to cancer treatment. And so that's really what spun me off. I kind of made a tweak and, you know, started in the very, very much so physical side of things. I studied kinesiology in my undergrad. I was a college athlete. So playing sports and, you know, getting into sports medicine. What'd you play? uh, College lacrosse. Awesome. Yeah. And that really opened my eyes to understanding the physical stuff is great. I love training. I love biomechanics of the body. I love all that. But if you're not addressing the multitude of other factors when it comes to your health, the physical is only going to take you so far. You know, if you're not eating well, you're not sleeping well, you're stressed out of your mind, your environment's a mess, your relationships are a mess. You're just, you know, not really addressing all these other variables. It doesn't matter how well your training is and how often you hit the gym. It's you're working an uphill battle. So upon realizing that, you know, I went back to school, studied naturopathic and functional medicine with an emphasis in clinical nutrition. Cause I really believe, you know, food is such a powerful vehicle and that's what you are what you eat, you know, it's really what comprises ourselves. And so that's what brought me to where I am today, where I run a global practice and help people from all walks of life, really taking this multidimensional approach, really analyzing all these different variables that come into play that cumulatively create a healthy person, really bring you Mm -hmm. mental, emotional, and physical well-being. And so that's kind of the quick synopsis of how I got into all this. Amazing. That's awesome. You know, it's such a unique opportunity to start studying functional medicine at such a young age. Where did you study functional medicine? I studied here in San Diego. So that's where I went to school for undergrad and postgrad. And I'm curious to hear your story, Ben, because I know you've been in the game longer than I have. Uh, I think (laughs) you know quite quite a bit longer. You're making me look like an old man. Uh, (laughs) But you know, I mean, I think that, you know, we all have our own respective stories as to, and, and usually our own respective struggles as to why we've gotten into doing what we do. And so I had my own personal battles. I grew up, as I said, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, played high school sports, played college sports, but throughout most of high school, I struggled with a lot of GI issues, a lot of like acid indigestion type issues that conventional medicine couldn't figure out. I was on multiple different medications, you know, acid blockers, whatever the the equivalent of like Nexium and, and Zantac and all of those types of things as a 16 year old kid, like, and no one was talking to me about obviously nutrition. I learned, you know, very quickly that there were certain foods that I could tolerate and certain foods that I couldn't tolerate by virtue of you know, getting sick, GI issues, throwing up, whatever. And that kind of plagued me throughout high school, throughout college to a degree. I played rugby at University of Arizona. Uh, so also played, you know, um, 
college sports. And all the while, one is fitness kind of came naturally to me. So I strength trained in high school for football, obviously trained in college to be a better athlete for, for rugby. Um, and you know, realized for myself, most importantly, that nutrition really was the a driving factor in my success because I had to, like there were certain things I, I could eat certain things. And so once I, I actually went to grad school at ASU, Arizona State University for exercise and wellness. And, and throughout that process, we were training, you know, athletes and doing some sport performance stuff. My kind of emphasis was strength and conditioning. So obviously I was into the training aspect all the while continuing to study nutrition. When I got out of school, I kind of took a deep dive into like, I got to figure out my own issues. It was still was plaguing me. Nothing had really been resolved. I had weaned myself off of medication, but I still knew if I was eat, ate a lot of gluten, if I ate a lot of dairy, if I drank too much alcohol, if I was overly stressed out, um, I noticed that obviously the symptoms heightened significantly. So that's when I actually started studying functional medicine. And I found a clinician out of Northern California named Dan Kalish. Do you know Dan? No, I don't. You no. Know, uh, so Dan was one of the early pioneers of kind of quote unquote functional medicine. Uh, and I started studying with him in 2006 or 2007. Um, and so it was kind of early to the game there. I got a really comprehensive understanding of what exactly that means with functional medicine, doing, you know, diagnostic testing, looking at adrenal pathways and the importance of, of GI system, right? And the gut microbiome and the relationship between the brain and the gut and the detoxification system and how all of the things were interrelated well beyond just what we look to in terms of food and exercise, right? And so that really gave me a really comprehensive and different and unique approach to how I was working with clients, as well as more importantly, how I was working on healing myself. And through that process, uh, we, you know, we ran some of these diagnostic tests, I realized I had a pretty nasty H. pylori infection that obviously had been plaguing me for what, uh, probably 10, 12, 15 years and healed that through natural, natural remedies, significantly revamped my diet uh, and felt obviously amazing after, you know, three to six months. And that really became kind of the foundation for how I started to work with clients, my just overall philosophy about health. And, and it's evolved over time because I was 20, you know, probably 25 at the time, no kids, you know, uh, I had a significant other who's now my wife, but, you know, very little responsibilities, good job at the time, very little stress. And so, of course, things evolve and kind of my vision and, and kind of philosophy of how I work with clients obviously has changed as to how I see what works and what doesn't over time. But that's really like, for me, um, my own health issues were the biggest driver of, Incredible. of why I am where I am. Yeah, I love that. And so I think that's a really good area to touch on because, you know, that's a huge GI challenge for so many folks that I see clinically in, in that they have this, you know, constant acid reflux, heartburn. And it sounds like that was really the, the, the main challenge with your GI system as far as symptomology goes. And so I think unpacking some of the strategies you've learned over the years to really help resolve that. I know one of my mentors, mm -hmm. Dr. Jonathan Wright, uh, I read his book early on why stomach acid is good for you. Cause a lot mm -hmm. of people are in this misconception that if you have acid reflux or heartburn, there's too much acid and you should take acid blockers and they're pounding right. tums like it's nobody's business. And it just makes matters worse. You know, these acid blockers really create so many problematic downstream effects because then it paves the way for gut pathogens. Like you mentioned, Heliobacter pylori and other types of things, because that acidity in the stomach is the first line of defense that kills a lot of these pathogens. And when you start to, you know, take these acid blockers, now you pave the way for parasites, for, you know, different overgrowths of bacteria and yeast right. and fungus. And that just creates this dysbiosis in the microbiome. So I'd love to hear from you. You know, if someone comes to you, Ben, and they're like, dude, I've had acid reflux so bad. I have trouble yeah. eating just about anything. Even when I clear out grains and gluten, even when I clear out dairy, yeah. it's still there. What's kind of your first few steps with a person in that situation? You know, funny enough, it's usually drink more water, which 
you know, most people are walking around terribly dehydrated. And obviously yeah. you need enough fluid to produce the digestive liquids necessary to break down your food. So it sounds so silly, but, and trust me, it took a long time to kind of realize, I think I had to realize it the hard way, but it, it truly is just making sure that we are hydrated enough to actually facilitate the biochemical processes that our body is meant to uh, you know, reinforce yeah. is paramount. It is. Right? It is. And another factor, it, and also kind of back a, to a fundamental concept I work with patients on is before I bring in, you know, digestive support and start doing all this gut analysis, I teach them how to eat. There's mm -hmm. so much talk in the space about intermittent fasting and when to eat. And then of course, what to eat, you know, different diets, different nutrition plans, but no one's talked about how to eat. And when you're mm -hmm. locked in this sympathetic overdrive, this fight or flight stressed out state, which so many folks are during your meal time, well, guess what? When you're in that sympathetic overdrive, your digestive system downregulates right. its production of stomach acid. It downregulates its production of digestive enzymes from the pancreas and your digestive capacity massively reduces, not to mention people are just plowing food as quickly as they can. First mm -hmm. stage of digestion is to chew properly, you know, do some mastication, let those salivary enzymes start to go to work. So it takes some of that burden off your gut. And when I teach people, you know, a couple of quick strategies that I find work great, it's just doing 90 seconds of deep breathing before you start your meal, just five second inhale through the nose, 10 second exhale by doubling the length of inhale versus exhale or exhale versus inhale rather. So you're doing twice the exhale that you are inhale. It really starts to lower resting heart rate, lower blood pressure, relax the central nervous system. And during which time I'll have them do a little prayer of gratitude, you know, say yeah. thanks for the food, simple things. This is free. This is a minute and a half of your time and just start starting to calm down the body and eat more mindfully, chew a little bit better, making sure you're not just rushing through your meals in this frantic state that alone. But we'll, we'll solve a lot of people's digestive problems. A hundred percent it will. And, and I like that you brought that up is I think I'm not a religious person, but there's certainly something to be said about the pre-meal prayer. It's just oh, yeah. taking a moment, calming down, sort of acknowledging and appreciating what you have in front of you, where you are, smelling the food, activating yep. the, the enzymes in your mouth, your salivary enzymes, because that's you know where the digestion starts, right? It starts in the brain, right? It starts in yeah. just thinking about the food that we're about to consume, because that's going to change our physiological processes and prepare us to digest, absorb, and assimilate those nutrients. So I can certainly appreciate uh, what you had to say there. And we're in a situation where we're just constantly in sympathetic overdrive. I'm, I'm sitting in front of, and I do it, you know, I yeah, do yeah. it uh, too, but just sitting in front of the computer or the television perhaps, and just mowing down food, not even thinking twice about it. And it's yep. certainly not conducive towards adequate digestion. So I think what you said there, as far as putting our body in appropriate position to actually be able to take in nutrients, making sure we're hydrated enough to actually produce the digestive uh, gastric juices necessary to break down our foods um, is, is fundamentally necessary. And that's where, you know, the environment obviously is incredibly important. Um, that obvious, that, that often solves a lot of the issues. So yeah. I think you alluded to now, of course, digestive enzymes can, can work wonders specifically something with hydrochloric acid as I've had, I personally have had a lot of success with um, adding hydrochloric acid and some other digestive enzymes to protein dense meals, just to aid in, in digestion and absorption. And I think the reality Ryan is as much as we talk about uh, helping reduce our sympathetic load, you know, the reality is a lot of people are going to be sympathetic dominant a lot of the time. Therefore, if there's something that we can do to aid in the digestive process, which very well could be supplementation, then that in and of itself can certainly help. Yeah, that's huge. And I think accountability for the eating aspect is big because I know my girlfriend had to just kind of remind me because, you know, we work all day, we expend all this energy, comes down to mealtime, you're freaking starving. Last thing sure. you're thinking is, let me do my deep breaths as this delicious food just gets cold in front of me. So it really takes a little bit of external reminders, I've noticed, for me at least, and for a lot of people I work with, just saying, hey, have your significant other, whoever you eat your meals with, your friend, you know, your children, your, your spouse, have them just remind you, hey, slow down, your food's not going anywhere, enjoy it, because this is one of the most sacred human experiences is to have the the pleasure and 
access to delicious nourishing food, which we all take for granted all too often. Mm -hmm. And you touched on a couple of things. I found people really benefit from digestive support. And there's a couple options. I I always tell people when it comes to testing, if your stomach acid is uh, inadequate, you know, in terms of your HCL production endogenously, uh, there's a quick and simple baking soda trick that I'll teach people where you just take a quarter teaspoon of baking soda first thing in the morning before you've had anything in your system, you get up, you get out of bed, you put a quarter teaspoon of baking soda in a few ounces of water, you chug it down. And if you don't burp in four or five minutes, you're not making enough stomach acid. And Mm -hmm. Dr. Jonathan Wright's work has shown, especially as we age and we get older, our stomach acid production begins to decline and our digestive capacity starts to go downhill, even if you're a healthy person. So he has so many of his patients on HCL and I find it to be inexpensive, very helpful supplement, particularly with dinner, because we, you know, our digestive system operates on this circadian clock, our, our biological rhythm. And what I've found with my work is we're really primed for food in the earlier parts of the day. And so many of us get off work, you know, five, 6 p.m., we get home, do a few things, start prepping dinner. Next thing you know, you're eating at eight o'clock. The sun is down, it's already evening time. And at that point in the day, your ability to digest your food just plummets. And also your ability to handle that food in terms of your uh, insulin sensitivity and blood sugar regulation, everything goes downhill. So all of your hormones and digestive system are really primed for food in the earlier parts of the day. So mm-hmm. I'm a huge advocate, Ben, of early dinners. I'm like, if you could push your dinner a few hours earlier, it makes a world of difference from everything from your sleep quality to your metabolic health and fat loss to improving your digestive system function. So many things get completely aligned and corrected when we're really eating at the right times. And we're not doing this backloaded intermittent fasting. So many people fall into where they're skipping breakfast, eating, eating their first meal at like one or 2 PM. And it's like, no, that first half of the day is when your body needs those nutrients. It's during sleep that you don't. So really front loaded intermittent fasting. I mean, I wrote about this in my book, Beyond Nutrition a couple of years back. And when I looked into the research of, you know, like Dr. Sachin Panda, one of the leading pioneers Mm -hmm. in, in circadian rhythm and, and intermittent fasting, it just makes sense. You know, we wouldn't uh, have evolved to eat when we can't see what we're doing, you know? No, for sure. I'm glad you brought that up. It's the two things. One is put the the stamp on the, the digestion topic and I'm um, eating, I, I suppose to some degree eating at night. One of the things that I encourage, especially for people with families is to actually have a structured family dinner because that's reinforcing all of the things that we just talked about. It's, yep. it's reinforcing sitting down, having, it's sort of like, if we're going to have a dinner, like you're going to be much more likely, if we're going to have a family dinner, you're going to be much more likely to have a quality family dinner, perhaps something that you cook yourself and, or if you're going to bring something in fine, but you're still sitting down, you're taking time, you're eating it, you're enjoying each other's company, you're having a conversation, you're turn, hopefully turning off the television and the outside stimulus and then you're, you're engaging, right, to the degree that you can say and lead by example for your kids, which I'm huge on. And I work with a lot of parents and it's like, hey, how do I get my kid to slow down when they're eating? Well, you know, take a look in the mirror, brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because odds are pretty good. You're shoveling it down um, and that's where they're learning it. And yep. so I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of leading by example. And there's nothing better. And research is very clear on the benefits of having the family meal. Oh, yeah. In terms of the communication of the child, helping them build their palate and the types of foods that they're willing to eat, especially helping them ingrain healthy eating behaviors as they get older, it really comes down to just leading by example. And so beyond that is I love that you brought up intermittent fasting. I think we are digging ourselves into a hole with so many people, and, and I'd love your, your input on this um, because you probably have a much better sort of clinician standpoint, but I'm of the opinion that people's blood sugar levels are so unstable. They're so sympathetic dominant, right? Our cortisol rhythms are so out of whack Mm -hmm. that for people that try and intermittent fast in the standard sort of not eat until noon, if you will, eat like 16, eight, not eat until from between noon and eight, we're setting ourselves up for disaster with this hormonal cascade cortisol, insulin, thyroid hormone. Um, what are you seeing clinically, you know, that perhaps is, is relevant or correlative to, to what I just said? 
I see it especially impact women. Men can typically yeah. get away with it. And, you know, obviously we're completely mm -hmm. different creatures. And, but with women, with their infradian rhythm, their biological 28 day cycle and their hormonal fluctuations, there's certain times of the month when an intermittent fasting protocol can be more efficacious, but not the entire month. There's other times where if they're going the whole first half of the day without any nutrition and just running on, most people really use caffeine as a crutch. So they'll pound coffee or tea yeah, just to kind of suppress, worse. Yeah, suppress mm -hmm. the appetite. But that just, like you said, jacks up your nervous system, destroys your adrenal glands and really starves your body of the raw materials it needs for proper brain and body function. And so I don't really recommend that type. I, I'm a more of a, the, under the impression that eating an, your, your first meal a few hours after waking is a far more uh, effective strategy. And then really focusing on that earlier dinner and not overthinking the breakfast, you know, eat when you're hungry. Don't force yourself to fast until 12 or one or 2 PM. If you get hungry at 9 AM, that's not going to be a sustainable strategy. And that's not going to serve your body in the long run. And I think there's a time and place for that intermixed. I think when it comes to fasting, people get in this, you know, headspace where it's like, I got to do this structured fast every day, 365. And it's like, that actually does not work well with intermittent fasting. No. Variability is the key because that's, what's going to drive norepinephrine, drive human growth hormone, and really create this hormonal optimization and this adaptation in the body. So I'm, I'm okay with people doing it a couple of days a week. I think that's great, but not right. seven days a week. You know, really having those fluctuations and also it varies based on your training level, based on your activity. You know, if you mm -hmm. did a heavy set of deadlifts and just crushed this gnarly workout the day before, you should not wait till 2 p.m. to eat your first meal the next day. Like your body is starving for nutrition. So those are also other variables to take into consideration. And I think a lot of people can do well. Here's let me back up a second. The reason people love that style, Ben, is because it is practical. When it comes to your schedule, people are on the move in the morning. They don't have time to prepare a healthy breakfast or they don't think they have time. You and I would argue they absolutely have five minutes. and It doesn't take that long when you <laughs> right. prepare yourself for success, but they, they don't think they have time. And they don't feel good when they have breakfast because of their food choices, because they're, you know, eating such high glycemic carbohydrates, all this starch and sugar. Conventional breakfast is definitely going to leave you feeling foggy, fatigued, and lousy. You know, if you grab a muffin for mm -hmm. breakfast, which is just basically cake, you know, of course, you're not going to feel well. But if you were to have a much more nutrient dense breakfast that keeps your blood sugar stable. And it's not a ton of food. Cause it's also like, you could have a big steak and eggs type of thing, which would be very nutrient dense, but it's so much food in terms of what it requires energetically for your body to digest. Now you have so much blood flow going to the gut instead of the brain. It will oftentimes leave people feeling, you know, low energy and, and brain foggy as well. If they're just intaking a high volume of protein and fat. So I'm a huge mm -hmm. fan of like a light smoothie for breakfast and sipping it slow. You know, people drink their smoothies like they're pounding a protein shake at the gym, like shake it up and just 30 seconds, it's down. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, we got to slow that down. I'm all about making a nutrient dense smoothie and sipping it over the course of an hour. Cause then you get this slow bleed of nutrition. It doesn't overwhelm the digestive system. It doesn't leave you feeling low energy or, or, or brain fogged. It just leaves you feeling amazing. And then you have all those raw materials on board to really perform at your peak mentally, physically, you know, it just really sets you up for success. So I'm a huge fan of that. Uh, when it comes to kind of like a good in between where you're not mm -hmm. having this big bacon and eggs and avocado breakfast that, you know, some people do well with other people, sure. it will still weigh them down more. So having a light smoothie that is going to give you some nutrition, but not leave you, you know, having to digest this totally, you know, really dense, heavy meal. Yeah, for sure. I, I couldn't agree with that more. And um, I'm definitely a big fan of eating before caffeine. And especially when we're talking about both males and females, but specifically females, specifically with blood sugar regulation based on their hormonal cycle, speci yep. sp specifically with thyroid function, mm -hmm. basically cortisol release relative to the caffeine on a daily basis. I think it makes a lot of sense. And I've seen a lot of really positive responses with females that actually track their blood sugar, um, that have a hard time regulating the blood sugar, making sure that they're actually eating in the morning before they drink their caffeine, making sure they're getting enough protein and carbohydrate at their first meal to get stable blood sugar. And yep. then they can drink more caffeine, which is going to be a lot less likely to drive up cortisol, get a glucose release, so on and so forth. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. And I think really what it comes down to is like, these are all like such valid things that probably people are a bit perplexed as to like all of the things that we just discussed. But I think the reality is people have to actually trial and error what works best for them and be honest with themselves yep. about how they're actually feeling. Not because Becky in accounting is doing keto and says she feels amazing and is down 20 pounds. Well, then that's what you need to do. Instead, it's like actually trying it if that's what you want to do, mm -hmm. actually being objective with yourself and saying, well, what are my results? And then subjectively, how am I actually feeling? How am I sleeping? Like, how is my digestion? Like all of these factors. And then also understanding that whatever's working right now may not be what's going to work in perpetuity. Yep. Understanding, like you said, to the degree of like this metabolic flexibility, this adaptation, that this hormesis that we're always adapting to stressors. We always should be adapting to stressors, which is what's beautiful about the human body, right? Is, is we're designed to be able to go through periods of feast and famine and, and be able to maintain this homeostatic response where we keep our blood sugar levels relatively stable, right? To the degree that there's going to be a lot of things that can work for you. You just have to find what works for you now. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and so many folks are under, you know, they, they've learned that hormesis and, you know, stressors are good, but they're under such a heavy load of chronic stress that you got to take that into consideration too, because you don't want to just throw all these quote unquote good stressors into the mix if your stress bucket is already full to the brim, you know, you got to take that into consideration. And one of the things I'd love to share, I just learned a few months ago, I interviewed a guy named Ian Clark on my podcast yeah, and bri brilliant dude. I don't yeah. know if you're aware of his work. And yeah. uh, he, he taught me a trick that I, I found fascinating and I started utilizing it with my patients and found great results. And what happens is a lot of folks get locked into sympathetic overdrive. So even if you're meditating, even if you're doing this great evening routine and trying to wind down, even if you're doing your deep breathing and all sorts of other strategies, they're still locked in sympathetic overdrive. And the reasoning of what he said is, is because of this, ultimately, one, it's just such a, a long-term chronic stress load that it's not like 15 minutes of meditation is going to just zap you right out of it, especially if it's been years on end that you've been in this state. Sure. And what happens during that time is you get a lot of blood flow from the gut into the legs because it's a, a primal kind of evolutionary adaptation because under times of stress, we'd want to be prepared to use our legs, to run, to kick, right. to, to basically survive. He actually found it through some research he was looking at is the way to unlock that sympathetic overdrive is to actually lay on your back for 20 minutes with your feet in a 90 degree position against a chair or against a couch. So your calves would be on the mm -hmm. butt portion of the couch where you would normally sit. Your hamstrings would be where your calves would normally be. And you're laying on your back on the floor and laying like this for 20 minutes every night for 15 days draws that blood flow out of the legs back into the gut and helps you get out of that chronic or, you know, fight or flight state and really integrate back into this parasympathetic cycle, which is really powerful for the digestion piece we talked about prior for our overall cortisol rhythm, our hormone, our hormonal balance, our sleep quality. So many variables come back to that. So that's a quick tip that I, I learned that I was like, yes, yeah, that's simple. That's free. That's easy. People will do that. And so I've been teaching people that and finding it and All right. getting stellar feedback, Ben. So you got to start incorporating that. I'm going to do clients. it, man. I'm going to yeah. do it for, for myself first. Yeah, and, yeah. and then certainly with clients, because I definitely need some of that right now. Uh, so that sounds great. Looking forward to that. And I know who Ian is. I met him at a couple of conferences. Super, super smart dude. Yeah. Great guy. Super smart dude. Cool. Well, that's like pretty good amount of, of, uh, of stuff that we just covered. Yeah. We're flying through it, man. Um, and one last thing, just to kind of tie a, a bow on some of the acid reflux stuff uh, that I'd like to share with people listening in. A couple of strategies I found work really well that are really simple to help upregulate your, your own production of hydrochloric acid, which like we talked about is oftentimes at the root cause of a lot of these acid reflux and heartburn issues is to do a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar about a half hour before your meal can really help to increase your, your stomach acid production. Uh, and then during your meal, actually having uh, some fresh squeezed lemon or lime juice, just in a couple ounces of water and kind of sipping that as a digestive, you know, the enzymes and the acid mm -hmm. in the citrus will also help to further break down the food. Uh, and then my favorite product for uh, di 
helping support digestion is made by a company called Thorn. It's called Biogest. And I yeah, find I taking it. two to four capsules of that at the beginning of the meal, particularly with dinner, find people don't typically have these digestive issues with breakfast or lunch. It's really kicks in towards the end of the day. Um, those are just a few quick action steps because I love giving kind of actionable advice people could walk away with and go try some new stuff for themselves and see how it helps them. I think it's great, man. It, uh, spot on. I love the Biogest. I, I like it specifically because, so I use, I use the Biogest, but I use the Biogest specifically with clients that have gallbladder issues or have no gallbladder, uh, right? Because it has ox bile in it and yep. we need yep. the, the bile to emulsify fats, but I also like uh, digest zymes from Designs for Health. I don't know if you have an experience with, with that one as well. No, actually. It's a very I, similar product. Very got similar. It. Got it. Yeah. When I'm using strictly digestive enzymes, I'll, I like one made by BioOptimizers. Uh, that's a good Love digestive it. enzyme blend. Um, but when I want to bring in some HCL along with the bio, like you said, mm -hmm. and it has some amylase, protease, and, and lipase in there, the BioGest is kind of a good shotgun formula for people mm -hmm. that I find works better than just enzymes on their own in, in the majority of situations. And if you find you take the, the HCL capsules for anyone listening in that tries this, you get you know uh, worse symptoms. It means that the acid is not the problem necessarily, right. and that you'd be better off trying just the digestive enzyme blend on its own uh, instead of the HCL. Without the HCL, yeah. And, and that's sort of like to make that clear what those symptoms look like. Oftentimes, it's sort of this uh, acid indigestion type burning uh, sensation in the epigastric region. So um, above the stomach, uh, kind of right below the, the chest breast plate. Uh, and often can be, you know, can feel like uh, undigested food, burping up, you know, food, uh, feeling like it's just not going down uh, and so on and so forth. Cool, man. Well, I think that that's probably a, a pretty good amount of information for our listeners to, no pun intended, digest. Uh, and so we can probably uh, wrap it at that. And then I'd love to have the opportunity to circle back with you in a couple months and jump on and can have a whole different host of topics that we can wrap about. Sounds amazing, man. Yeah. So for people listening in, where could they find you, Ben? What's the best place for people to connect with you? Yeah, brother. Uh, so our website is BSL Nutrition. BSL stands for Body Systems Lab. So it's bslnutrition.com. And we have a podcast, obviously it's Smart Nutrition Made Simple Show. Beyond that, we're on social media at BSL Nutrition. And so come on over, check us out join the club. And then for you, uh, where can people find more about you and your business? Yeah. Uh, website, ryankennedyhealth.com, pretty straightforward. And then uh, Instagram is probably my most active uh, social media platform. And that's just at Ryan C. Kennedy. And then the podcast as well. This is we're kind of releasing this on both, both of our ends. Um, we're at the Ryan Kennedy show, real simple. And would love for people to tune in. I'm actually just launching a, a daily uh, Q and a segment. So every weekday I'll be answering community people, uh, questions from the community, uh, on all topics related to health and wellness. And so that's going to be a great place for people who are looking for kind of detailed answers of their burning health questions. And so that'll be in conjunction with the uh, long form interviews I publish once a week. So I think that'll be a great resource for people to check out. Uh, and that's going live in the beginning of August. So just next week at the time of this recording, it's great, dude. Awesome. Well, uh, congrats on that. It sounds like everything's going great. I appreciate you taking the time to catch up with me. I always enjoy these conversations with other like-minded people in the space doing good things. So thanks for sharing your knowledge and wisdom and catch up soon. Likewise, Ben. The feeling's mutual, man. Take care, brother. Thank you so much for listening. And if you found this content valuable, here are four ways I can help you in your nutrition journey for free. One, Grab a free copy of my Fat Loss Fix Guide at fatlossfixguide.com. Two, join my free group at smartnutritionmadesimple.com. Three, subscribe to my YouTube channel at smartnutritionmadesimpletv.com. Four, leave a five-star rating and positive review so that we can gain access to more nutrition experts ready to share their knowledge with you and ultimately help more people make smart nutrition simple. 